You're broadcasting live. Yeah. So you can just go around and maybe talk to people at tea. Live. This is good. Go on to YouTube. channel of access. Yes. But there'll be, I can send you a link, it'll be there forever. So you can watch it back. Yep. Um, we're nearly there. Are live, man. Send it to me. I need your slides. Okay, we'll do so. Yep. Your slides? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I'm on. I'm looking at it now. SPU. You need to go to okay, the yeah. sub Yes, and the uh, only one in there. Okay. Yes, that's all. Okay. All right. Hmm. All right, so you can see. That is what's being broadcast. Interesting. Hmm. Oh, so it's actually showing that. Look, we've got two cameras going. The one will show your slides. The other yes. one will show what he's videoing. So he can video you as you're speaking and as you're starting your talk, and then we can switch to your slides. Yes. Yeah. And there's only people standing. Is it? Oh, so what's on the screen will be what's yeah. going out. So, okay. And then as soon as you finish, we'll swap again, and we can video you answering the questions. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. How many cameras can you add? As many as you want, but it slows it down. The more you add, the faster internet you need to sustain it. Uh, okay, now what I need is the link. It's observing, right? John Herschel. Yes. Okay, so I need to post this so that people actually have the link. And this is, okay, so you can see now this is what's being broadcast live on YouTube. Nice, eh? So I'm going to share that link with the Facebook group and then everybody can watch. Ah, no, I don't want to sell something. Why are you Why are you studying? Thank you. 
But I'll uh, uh, lead you through a fun slice just to show um, what some of the aspects of global change are, why they are concerned, what are we as students, what are we able to do about it. And uh, where are we heading with, with all of this? What are our hopes and how are we able to influence our hopes? But specifically, and that's what you, you will see, that's a thin sliver of the material is what we as the organization are working for, SAYON, South African Environment of the Network, what we are actually uh, up to with this. <coughs> have to learn how to move this on. Then, which button? I'm pressing both. Just press that to go forward. Oh, okay, good. Right. You have to remember we live in a, in a universe that's actually very hostile to life. We are in a very rare exception here. Out there in the universe, um, temperatures range from um, extremely freezing. The average of the universe is minus 370 degrees Celsius. And uh, obviously, if you are near a star, um, it's a lot hotter. Near Earth? This is just outside our atmosphere. It is a little bit more, um, a little bit nicer for the sun to warm things up. But there is also the shadow side on the on the other side of the Earth. So it is still outside the limits of what uh, life would sustain. At the end, at the Earth surface. This is where we are. It is minus 87 to 57 degrees. And we obviously select the middle range that is uh, more suitable. The average temperature of the atmosphere, the average everything and all the habitats on Earth um, above this surface is about 14 degrees, but that is changing. And it has been changing in history. If you look at the history of the Earth, there have been enormous <coughs> escalations up and down of temperature. In the last 
million years since humans have been around, that is not in the same form as today. Um, it's actually been largely below the average of what we've been experiencing in the last few decades. But if you look right at the end over there, it is shooting well above what humans have ever experienced. We are heading towards a warm Earth with the atmosphere. Um, that is more than what humans have experienced in our history. If you look at the CO2 levels, also the long-term ones, you will see that recently CO2 has been elevated very strongly. Here on the right side, that uh, strong peak, it's especially since uh, the Industrial Revolution, 1850 onwards, and uh, in line with that, not only in line, you will see there's a thick blue line there that denotes human population. Our numbers have been on the increase. And so is the CO2, and so is the, the uh, thermal environment. There's a whole long list of what's been changing in line with this. There are a lot of studies actually behind it. There is actually a little doubt at this stage that the uh, root cause amongst a whole host of, of factors, one of the root causes are we, humans, what we do on Earth. In order to live, in order to have our standard of living and do what we do, but the way we do it, um, we are changing our environment, and um, linked with it is a higher frequency of all sorts of things, floods, droughts, um, strandings, because the uh, ocean uh, sea level surface um, is changing, um, and other species are being affected, and they also become used because of the changing levels. There's starvation, there are diseases, there are all sorts of linked situations. I'm not lecturing you on this today, because that's a very uh, in-depth situation. There's been a lot of de um, debate worldwide in whether the uh, symptoms we uh, say are linked to climate change are real. Um, I'll at the end refer you to our website where um, there is an article actually on that, just uh, outlining where are we right now. This is the perspective of SAIL, my organization, so, uh, on behalf of South Africa. Uh, if I say on behalf of South Africa, maybe I should pause here and say we are an organization created within the National Research Foundation, which is an entity of the Department of Science and Technology. And um, our role is actually to observe global change and the aspects related to land use changes. Because we are affecting the land as well. We are not using it in the same way it was used in the past, and there are all sorts of interlinked aspects that relate to the resources and how habitats behave and other species and the ecosystem services, only to mention a few. To return to this situation here, there's a lot of evidence that there is a lot of change on, on, uh, on Earth, and that it has been recent, like the sea level changes. Like the warming of the atmosphere, you can look anywhere in the world and the average is heading up. Um, the uh, uh, the uh, ice thickness has been declining, which is um, uh, uh, actually an as aspect as, as well uh, related to that. And uh, the snow level uh, on the on the 
mountains. We don't have such high mountains in South Africa, but really the highlands often have snow, and you can see there's now less snow. This, this all has ecological uh, effects, as well as on the water regime, the holding of the water, the release of the water off the snow, and how species respond to these changes, all are part of the changes. We know that the uh, temperatures that I've been speaking about are not evenly spread over the Earth. There are some places that are very hot. Here you can see North Africa, but South Africa is one of the hot areas in the world as well. And um, we have seen a change in rainfall. In some areas, there has been an increase, for instance, in eastern Peru, and that's also the western free state areas, there has been actually an increase. And in over most of the northern head, uh, there has been a decrease. There's also been a decrease in Kwanzulu Natal. Thing. We're speaking here of overall averages, we're not speaking of single events with a major flood or a <coughs> drought in the midst of it. These are averages. Where, are, where is everything heading? Also, the long term observations have shown that the environment around us is changing. Maybe this is natural. We don't know. We need to. Uh, work on that. That's that's one of the aspects that Simon is looking at. How do these trends that I mentioned earlier on relate to the actual environment that we see, the vegetation. Uh, near here is Martha's from I mean, it's a it's a war site with a, a photograph taken. If you look at that site now, recently at least, it has changed. The soldiers would have been able to hide behind trees. At that stage, when the war was raging, anyone who knows about that, they had nowhere to hide. They had to lie flat on the plains, the open plains. In the eastern Peru, where they have been shrubs, been replaced by grass. Well, that is the greening that I spoke of. There has been war rain in the last few decades in that particular area. There are all sorts of changes, and in order to understand them, and also to be able to plan what to do about them, what to do about the effects, we really need science. We need everyone to think about it, to need to brainstorm, we need the Einstein's out there to find out, okay, uh, there are some solutions here, there are ways by which we are able to get out of this trap. Remember, the trap is Earth is a ball floating to the universe. It's a very thin atmosphere. There's very little separating a hostile world from where we live and have a living environment. Long term observations are a way to test how these various Effects interrelate, or they, how, how they actually, the one may cause the other, or they may be caused by something else and both be uh, affected, or they may both change, but they're not really related to it. You have to understand that whole relationship before we then think of what we are able to do about it. If you have long term ecological research, it's not the same as your normal research. Some of you will be uh, uh, one day working on your honors thesis, master's thesis, PhD thesis, and also on your research. And usually, three, four years is the maximum that uh, research happens. Then you work on, the organizations work on, and that's it. 
we are not able to understand the long-term aspects or able to go back to, necessarily go back to what you found in your study and actually compare that later on as to what's the situation like now, unless there's an organization that's able to, to actually commit to those observations of certain, certain indicators. To understand what these indicators do, it's then to design experiments, field experiments, and not necessarily easy, I'll talk about some. And then to analyze this, to then uh, Enlarge the scope to a model from which, which then needs to be tested with the real world. Um, in other words, real data. If, if we worked out something just on our laptop and say, okay, this is how it works, I want to go back into the field again and say, okay, is this real? And then from that, we can draw conclusions. And these conclusions then lead into the next cycle because we've learned more. We now know how to be even smarter about what to observe, what experiments, and so on. So this is this is really iterative, but it is a long-term commitment. And that's where you say on fits in. It's the organization pass exactly with that. You observe that, you know. The useful um, indicators to test them and to derive useful conclusions. Simon has observation sites across South Africa. Um, this is uh, not certainly not showing the complete set, it's only to show that at, on land and at sea, offshore, near shore. And in the various areas across South Africa, there are long-term observations. Some of them relate to changes. I will speak about them. Changes like you'll see there's a, in the blue block in the middle, there's fracking, the shale gas plants. So there are certain observations that have been planned in relation to that. Or the SKA. I won't expand into that. Uh, some of you might not know what the SKA Actually, who knows what the SKA is? Everybody? Okay, I'll explain it later on. Um, there's, there's the offshore work. How is the ocean changing? Because ocean is, uh, is very important to drive climate. A lot of our food is derived from the ocean. So we need to know what's actually happening there. Not only within South Africa, the, the ocean near South Africa and the way it enters the Atlantic affects the climate of Europe. So we have to understand at this end what's actually happening or likely to happen on, on the other end. So we're not able to, this is not about nations, it's, uh, it's interlinked globally. I, I missed saying something when we were introduced to Sion. It was the ILTR, International Long-Term Ecological Research Network. And um, in that network, uh, there are other nations who uh, are actually involved in that. Have I been you right? Five minutes. I think I have a few more slides than five minutes, but I can um, let me actually say the rest of it. We are not the only ones looking at this. There are organizations around the world uh, that really are interlinked with. And um, the, uh, our understanding is therefore not isolated. It's not what we are analyzing. We compare with other nations that are maybe not so hot and uh, so on. So um, uh, there are land-based uh, situations. We have a lot of um, infrastructure, research infrastructure on land. Some of the effects that like fire on them uh, is shown here on, on, on the left. Um, 
these are not only weather stations, these are uh, systems like that measure the carbon flux from Earth into the atmosphere or the other way around. Because there are questions how does the soil and the vegetation uh, take CO2 out of, the, out of the atmosphere in order to understand this whole, whole interaction? And obviously, at the heart of everything that everyone does uh, is water. So there are a lot of water-related aspects in relation to the plants, but also the, the hydrology of species, the uh, microhydrology of plants at the soil level, and uh, and also uh, how mountains and other aspects of terrain. This is the highest weather station in South Africa that's been installed by Sam. Um, how all of that uh, fits into our understanding of the water dynamics. And it's not only where we um, uh, we are not only the specialists, the scientists saying this is what we do, we are actively nurturing the next generation of scientists. Starting here at school, we have a very active schools program to advance the interest in science by the learners, and also we have postgraduate students who, who work on some of the um, themes within our organization. Now, if I understand it correctly, uh, my five minutes are up, which took me a bit of a surprise. I could stop here or continue another five minutes. <laughs> All right, okay. And uh, just run you through some of the aspects of our arid lands, no? First of all, um, it's not only the dry half of South Africa that we, there are various aspects of dryness and different vegetation zones. If you look at that, that area around here, um, you will see that even the best known species <coughs> of birds are least known in the northern pet. It's the least known area as far as science is concerned. There are data, a lot of them sitting in archives, need to be waiting to be uploaded and compared with the situation right now. And there are a lot of opportunities of point sources. The largest kind of ecosystem that has never been properly studied in, in this arid half are wetlands. Because they don't normally look wet, but there are lots of them. But when they are wet, well, they are a bit of an unexpected situation. You don't think there's anything special when you often arrive there. But sometimes this is what they look like. And then there's a lot of life in them and on them. Lots of birds flocking in, they somehow seem to know where the water is when. There's obviously something for them to eat, otherwise they wouldn't be there. Uh, there's a whole host of shrimps and algae and so on. So they're not poor in species. And they have to develop very rapidly and then go into dormancy, waiting for the next saturation. But the dry pans, which have often been described as uninteresting in mushrooms, are not mushrooms. There's a lot of life living and very interesting life. And actually, uh, you often wonder how do they, how do they actually survive? They are there. What did they actually do? We don't know. We are starting to have these records of them. These are real data which we collected at uh, a site where the land seed record will be collected later on this year. At 
Um, it's a it's one of the largest and in South Africa, if not in the world, and you need a large a long flat area to do that race. We found it a lot more interesting as to what's living on the pan than what people will be doing with the pan. We're also looking at things we thought we knew a lot about, like locusts. They are erupted once in a while, suddenly there's a swarm, we thought there are no locusts around anymore, and suddenly, woof, there's a whole swarm again. There are a number of species in this arid area that respond like that, suddenly erupt. Here you can see the long-term locust ripples. They're still erupting, not at the same uh, frequency that's actually more frequent than it used to be since they started to want to stop the locust outbreaks. We still don't understand how it operates. It is an arid land species, and they're not erupting that yellow area is where the species is coming to find. You don't find the species anywhere else in South Africa, but in that small area in the Peru. And then, at certain circumstances, they explode over the whole of Southern Africa. You don't understand how this happens, why this happens, and what this means for the species, although it is, it is uh, a by everyone that it is a disaster because they eat crops and a whole host of other things. Um, I'll actually skip through some of these aspects because our studies, um, uh, there's a whole range of, of studies uh, where we are wanting to understand what are the symptoms of climate change. Some of them we haven't yet detected change. We have Baseline study, you can see what's there now. We can look at it later on. You can see how variable it is now. We might not understand how variable it is. One of the largest, no, not one of the largest, the largest South African river is Orange. And uh, uh, we are near the mouse area here. We are having a long term study. In fact, um, I will actually skip these next slides because uh, the time is up and you can see how much more I had to say. I will uh, expand only on one. If you can look at the titles, please. I'm um, just to show on one thing. I said to you I'll explain what SKA is. We are involved at SKA. It is a large area where um, in the land use is being changed and all the farms are being restocked, water holes closed, fences removed, and uh, um, and that presents us with an opportunity of 150,000 hectares to actually uh, look at what the uh, the results are that we land use change. So it's not the effect of farming, it's the effect of not farming a area that has been farmed over the last 150 years. A lot of land use changes and the effects over the area. We are establishing a lot of observation sites over it. And um, uh, the various themes we are interlinking and um, um, uh, all of this isn't only for us to have, to have students to get uh, thesis. Um, it is actually to inform, to ultimately flow into society and actually feed back again. Because that, uh, uh, that way society realizes the importance of science and will actually support it further. So, with that, I thank you.
two components. Do you find that when you establish a model based on a particular set of data, when you go back into the fields to refurbish the method, um, the model you tend to be biased. You find when you're initially making the model, you tend to want to sample them less because now you know what needs to fit into the real
Thank you and appreciate you for your time coming here. Thank you very much. Quite one. 
uh, as we all know, diversity is, it, and it's in fact the progress that human society has made from the sciences to the political realm is because of diversity of views, diversity of opinions, diversity of the way we view life, and including the diversity of life on Earth. So, if you have those kind of people trying to solve problems for you, you are clearly better off than having one person trying to solve the problem. But of course, the irony is that it is that problem of us seeing things from different perspectives. So if you give this group of guys a problem to solve, they are going to fight a lot. They will make progress eventually, including how we solve the problem of climate change on Earth. Uh, that's why we've never been able to really come to an agreement. And then we come to one agreement, and then one country pulls out of that agreement overnight, and all that, and all that. So, what I, I take that background so that you appreciate that there is a huge diversity of life on planet Earth. Look at that picture that captures just some of the diversity that we have on Earth. But do you see any problem with that? I'll come to that shortly. Now, there are about 9 million eukaryotic species on Earth. Eukaryotic species are organisms with two nucleus with a double membrane bound organelles. There are about 9 million species of them on Earth. Scary, eh? And about 86% of terrestrial species and 91% of species in the oceans are not yet described. Are not yet described. We don't know them. So we so on Earth, on, on terrestrial habitat, we only know about 14 percent of the species, and in the oceans, we only know about nine percent. So we are very very ignorant. <laughs> and then a recent study found that uh, on Earth we are. And this is a conservative estimate, by the way. We have one trillion microbial species. And this is a conservative estimate. I read the paper myself, and I looked at the technique, and I found that it's a very conservative estimate because they don't want to overestimate. Because each individual, as I'm standing here, I have my own microbes that are carrying. Totally different from what you are carrying. Now, multiply that by Seven point something billion human beings. We are not talking about the ones flying in the air, the one in your cell phone, the one in the soil, the one in your car, the one in your bedroom. You don't even want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing I'd like you to also note is that the diversity of life on Earth has not just happened overnight. It has taken all those geological processes, ecological processes, evolutionary processes to make this happen. And it's the same process that are also maintaining the diversity of life that you have on Earth. So we will now go to plant diversity, just to give you in quick numbers. Uh, the global estimate of land plants. Land plants include your, your farming plants, your gymnos plants, your farms, your horses. The, the estimate is about half a million species. South Africa has 8% of global vascular plant uh, diversity and uh, about 22,000 uh, species of plants. It's one of the most diverse uh, countries in the world in terms of plant diversity. And it's the only country in the world that has a flora kingdom all to itself. Okay, there are about six flora kingdoms, but South Africa has one all to itself. It's not sharing it with any other uh, country. Uh, it's the Cape Floristic region. So this shows the global diversity of uh, vascular plants, and you will see that South Africa comes quite high. Anywhere where you see the purple, I hope it's purple because I'm somewhat colorblind. Anywhere, <laughs> anywhere where you see the purple, you, that's a high degree of plant diversity. And you can see that South Africa uh, has some of these. And if you consider the land, the, the area of South Africa related to the rest of the world, the amount of plant diversity that, is, uh, that you have in South Africa is quite massive. It's something to be proud of. I mean, look at a desert. I don't know any other desert in the world that is this beautiful. 
most deserts are boring. Yeah. <laughs> but the Kerou Desert is exceptional. And it's just around the corner here. So let's quickly land up on global diversity. There are about 1.7 million species that have been formally identified. And human beings, we human beings, we are very limited in our ability to recognize and recall morphological variations. So an expert in a particular field will probably know maybe 1,500 species that he can recognize within. Maybe you would have a few people who would probably be able to identify 2,000 species and, and distinguish them. But most people will not be able to go beyond that number. And if you look at the huge number of species that we don't know yet, then that creates a problem. So, the, so what's the solution? We create a, genet a genetic-based identification system, otherwise known as a DNA backlogging system. And by the way, we are losing species even before we know them. The rate of species extinction is quite high. So if we don't do something quickly, we'll be losing things that we don't even know are there. And so we are losing resources that could help us in the future, either for food or for medicine. So it's something very critical that you need to think about. So we'll go to the second part of the talk, which is DNA backcoding uh, approach to plant diversity. Now here, I'll just give you a quick rundown because we are not going to all the, how you measure things in the lab and all of that is not necessary for the purpose of this talk. But the, the question is, what's the big idea behind DNA backcoding? The idea of using that word backcoding is actually a, a brand new gimmick that has worked quite well. And it came from this universal product code, which you are all very familiar with. You go to the shops and you take an item and you take it to the seal and, and the, the person just scans it and then you have a price. Okay? So a DNA barcode is somewhat similar because you use this universal product code to actually identify the, the items and then the price of that item. A DNA barcode works somewhat like that. It's a short gene sequence that you take from the entire genome and you use that to identify an organism. So that is generally uh, how the DNA barcoding system works. And what happens is that you will take that sequence, that DNA sequence from an unknown specimen, and you, you compare it to publicly available database of sequences. And then hopefully, if, if it's there, then you'll be able to find a match. But we'll get to that later. And then what's the genome? Genome basically means all the totality of genes that you have in the system, in an organism, or the total number of genetic material you have in an organism. To like all the total amount of DNA that you have. So, for instance, the human being has just over 3 billion base pairs, nucleotide base pair sequence for every individual. That's a lot. Uh, and in, in case of uh, viruses, they don't have DNA, they have RNA instead, and that will constitute their genome, their genetic material. So, if you look at, if, if let's say we have eight individuals and we got their sequences. Their DNA sequences, we usually write all those A, C, G, T, and all of that. So what you do is that if you if you color code each of those nitrogenous bases, you color code them, then you get something and you remove those alphabets and you left colors. Then you get something that is akin to that, like something similar to that uh, DNA barcode that we're talking about. So you have something like that, and that's how the idea, the notion of the DNA barcode comes from. That's why they give it that name. It's because it's somewhat similar at that level, and uh, it achieves basically the same thing. You want to be able to identify an unknown specimen. So for, for, for animals, zoologists have worked on this, and they found that there, there's a portion of the genome of animals that works best for most animals, and they've come to use this mitochondria cytochrome C oxidase gene, which is generally shortened as CO1, and it's used as DNA marker or barcode for most animals. It works for most animals on Earth. So this is your mitochondria genome, 
and this is the, the this is the entire microcontroller genome, but this is the portion that you use for DNA barcoding for animals. That's the CO1 portion. In plants, things are not so straightforward. So what they've done in plants, after a lot of fighting and arguing over many years, they found two regions that work quite well. The RBCL marker and the MATK gene. And those two regions are what are used for plants. So if you, that's a typical chloroplast. They are both chloroplast uh, uh, markers. <laughs> so that's a typical chloroplast genome. And that's the math case somewhere there. And that's the RBCL on that question. So those are the two that are used for plants. And these have been found to work quite well for diversity of organisms. I mean, the, the CO1 for, for most animals, and the math and the RBCL uh, for, for uh, plants. By the way, those are just names of the genes in the genome. So uh, scientists have a molecular biologist have a very strange way of giving names to Don't worry so much about that. <laughs> so the DNA backcoding part pipeline. So what do you do if you really want to backcode an organism? Obviously, you have to collect the organism. So you go to the field or go to some museum and you collect uh, the, the specimen and you sample some tissues. And then this is the lab part of the show. This is the laboratory part where you, you do all the measuring and all those things like you do in the lab. And then you eventually get a sequence from your sample. And then you send that sequence into, uh, into a potter, a DNA potter, uh, a, a DNA sequence potter, where you clean it, you try and do all sorts of, try to validate that data to make sure that everything is fine. And then from there, it goes into, into the major uh, 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 publicly available database, uh, like the gene bank or the BOLD. BOLD is just the backbone of life uh, uh, directory. And then once it gets there, it's available for the public to use. So members of the public can use it. So if you, if you go online, if you went online and you type gene bank, you get, uh, and then ends all the pipe and NBCI, you get to a place where you, you get to actually see sequences of almost any of the same contact that has been placed there. And it's a very massive collection, huge collection of data there. So you do that in the field or in the aquarium, you do that in the laboratory, and then, oops, Ooh. what's happening now? <laughs> Uh, the secret is out. <laughs> okay, and and so uh, so so. That, but the, the, the key thing is whether your DNA barcoding will work very well is a function of something which you would. I'll give you an analogy that would help you to to actually visualize it. You all know that police routinely try to they collect our these days now they collect our fingerprints. Call it biometric uh, data collection. Am I correct? When you go for your ID or you want to apply for visa or something, in such a country, they say they need your biometric and they take your, your fingerprints. Now, DNA barcoding identification scheme works in a similar way. Your, your, your fingerprint goes into a database. The same way, when you sequence an organism, when you sequence the, uh, the DNA of an organism to submit it into a database. So suppose the police comes into this room and takes me, always to use this because it can you. And they take me and they check my fingerprints and they don't find a match on their system. It's one of two things. Either I'm a new species of human being <laughs> or they've never captured, I've been around, but they've never captured my fingerprints into their system. So how useful that database would be would be how large the collection and diversity of fingerprints that they have there. Okay? So they can now, so that if, if I did something wrong, they can now put it through and then they know, oh, that's only if that. The same thing exactly, that's the way it works 
but DNA backcoding. So we try to build a very massive database <laughs> such that when you go to the field and you collect your sample and you do your specimen and you do your sequencing, hopefully there will be a match on the system. But if there is no match on the system, what do you do? Any, any clue, any idea? There's no match on the system. You, you get to do what? Can you describe it as a new species? Okay, you are almost there, but, but it's, it's close. But you, what you have to do, you don't know whether it's a new species, it may just be that it's not on the, it's not been captured yet. So it's possible that it's a new species, and you're already preempting one of the things I would say later. So very good, clever. Uh, so, but, but the key thing is if, if, you, if it's, for, for you to be really sure, you need to send it to experts in the field, and then they would morphologically look at it and try to identify it, and then they put the name here for you, and then you put it on, on there on the gym band. So you've helped the next person who work on that sample because it doesn't have to go through that process again. Now, now you find a match on the system. You understand? So DNA backcoding helps us because it's rapid. If it's, if it's there already, you'll find a match and then you can move on. And you don't need to be an expert in these things. So now let's look at applications of DNA barcoding and the new direction that the technology is taking us. First is, is, is as a research tool for taxonomists. Taxonomists are this group of people who try and fight over names of plants and animals and that we all find and they always find reasons to disagree in a very good way. Okay. <laughs> so it's so it's, it's so they use it to identify species and then they use it to test the consistency of definitions of, of species. One of the arguments in biology, one of the major controversies in biology is something called the species concept. I don't know whether you've heard of it. Yes. Species concept is very controversial, it has been controversial since the time of Darwin, it is still controversial today. And one of the ways in which we biologists look at it is to check our definition, just to have another way of checking our definition of species. Because generally, taxonomists used to define species using only morphological features. So we can have additional source of data in form of DNA uh, to check that definition and see whether it's true or not. Then this is where it interests you. If you're not a taxonomist, because you'd be wondering, oh, I'm not a taxonomist, I'm not interested in fighting by the name of birds. Okay, <laughs> I'll leave that to Doug. <laughs> um, so if, if you are not a taxonomist, how can DNA barcode be useful to you? Generally, you've heard of things called invasive species that comes into our country and can cause massive economic damage, cause ecological disaster. How do you identify something as invasive? How do you know what to allow in or what to keep away? DNA barcoding can help. But that's not even the last of it. This is where it concerns you most, to test the purity and identity of biological products. Because we are living now in an age where there is a lot of um, herbal products over the counter that people are buying. And then they will list, list the, the, the composition. It has these four plants in it. But you don't know whether it does have those four plants or whether they misidentify it. And some of the things that they misidentify could be something that can kill you. Maybe not directly, it can cause you kidney failure, it can cause you uh, 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 liver breakdown and all that because they just identify something toxic and they put it there because it's a very closely related species and so they just put it there and they didn't bother. So, and then in, uh, in 2008, a study was published. Uh, a study was published. This study was actually carried out by two high school kids. They went to a restaurant. <coughs> To other sushi, and if you know your sushi, uh, it could be expensive depending on the type of fish that is used. So this very clever restaurant claimed a very expensive um, uh, fish as being a component of their sushi, and then they were able to to, to charge their 
clients something like say equivalent of 500 grams. Okay, whereas it's a different, very cheap fish that they use that should cost no more than 100 grams. And these two high school girls went there, took the sample, sent it, they didn't even want to do anything by them. So rather than took the sample, sent it to scientists in the lab, and they found out that these guys have been fooling people, they are using a cheap fish. It's not what they claim to be. So you have somebody, somebody was ripping people off, and if the study was published. And it raises a very important thing as to all these various things that you buy over the counter, or you go to the shops, and they say this contains the tail of a cow. Hopefully, you can recognize a cow, but if it's something that you can't recognize, they can be ripping you off, and it becomes very, very important that correct identification is a key thing. Uh, uh, so, and, and I'll give you another example. The, the plant that I did my PhD on is called the uh, African monkey or species. The seed of some of the species are poisonous to the level that it can kill an adult human being. Now, in India, somebody misidentified one species and they used the seed, and it was a timely intervention and a big visit to the accident and emergency that saved that person's life because they misidentified the species and then they used it. So, correct identification, misidentification may be fatal for some products. And then finally, DNA barcoding can serve as a discovery tool. That lady, said, that's, that's the plot point where I said she entered my talk. When she said, oh, it's likely to be a new species. Because once, once you can't find your match, then you begin to suspect. Is it that we have not captured this, or is it a new species? So it can raise the question, and it can help in discovering new species. And many new species have been discovered using this technology because they couldn't find them online, and then they checked, they sent them to, to expert, and expert says, you know what, this is quite, quite completely different from what we, use, what we have. It's a new species, and then they went ahead and described it. So it's a very powerful tool for rapid discovery of species, new species. Now, finally, I'll just give you the new direction in which uh, DNA barcoding is moving. It's this two things called uh, meta barcoding and next generation sequencing. They are like husband and wife, they, they go together. And what happens in meta barcoding is that you, you have Instead of your traditional backcoding, where you are you are taking just one sample and one marker, or well, you, you you take a couple of samples and then you take one marker to try and get there. Here you can take an environmental sample that has several different species in it, and then because of this technology of next generation sequencing, it can handle different markers and different organisms simultaneously. And it's called high throughput sequencing. And you can, and it's very rapid, and it gets you from, so you, you, you collect a soil sample that has all, all sorts of things in it. There are plants there, there are animals, there are earthworms, there are microbes, and you take them through this process. And at the end of the day, it enables you to identify different species that are in that environmental sample. And that has been quite massive. So this is the workflow for metabarcoding. You collect an environmental sample, you extract the DNA of all of them because you don't know what's in there, and then you do all those amplification of markers, you send them to next generation sequencing, which is the high throughput sequencing, and then you process all of that and you get all the various species that are there. And it's very useful for ecological analysis because you can now collect from different sites and see which organisms, which set of organisms are found in different sites and all that. And it's been used for a lot of other things both for systematics, for identification in ecology, and so many other ways. And by the way, just to let you know how important the, the barcode came, South Africa is one of the, one of the major uh, uh, portal for, for DNA barcoding uh, at the University of Johannesburg. Anybody from the University of Johannesburg here? Okay. The University of Johannesburg, uh, and they will be hosting it uh, later this year the uh, Back Coding of Life International Conference. So, thank you.
of access was watching online and he asked me to put hand up for him because he wants to ask a question or a comment. I'm calling him. <laughs> Hi Neville, you're on the speaker. Hello everybody, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, thank you very much. I, the, talk, the talk's very interesting to me in particular because my background is also in Malaysia and genetics and very many of the applications you spoke about in the talk the very same that I did um, uh, for my PhD, in fact, and um, it was um, based on, on on exactly those kinds of applications, looking at cryptic species, um, and looking at population genetics, and looking at what species and what different populations, for example, and then um, uh, in particular, we used a, a mitochondrial DNA. Uh, to identify species which we call DNA footprints rather than DNA fingerprints. And the reason and the application for that is quite interesting. It's, it's uh, uh, you might all have heard about abalone poaching or parallel wound poaching. It's a big problem here. Um, and what happened was uh, people would, would, would go and take uh, our local species and they take the shell off and all features that are really uh, morphological features that distinguish between a species. And then they would can it and label the tin can as um, a product of Australia. Um, and there was no way to tell what was in the tin can uh, so they could get away with it. And until we used uh, mitochondrial DNA to distinguish between the different species, and then you know, take a sample out of, out of, the, out of the can, uh, analyze the DNA using a system called RFLP, so they are better ways of doing it. And then they are able to tell which is what species, and that's where we can convict people approaching. Um, and uh, and so uh, that's what we need the application for. So um, I really enjoyed sort of the ad that that's a, a system which we use in all different kinds of ways. There's some fantastic stories which we reviewed in the paper in years ago, which I, I just sent to uh, Carl. Uh, one, one story was there were fishing competitions. Where people would um, um, actually get a big prize in the United States for catching the biggest fish. And what they would do is bring a big fish with them to the competition and then stick it on their hook and pull it up the water and pretend they caught it there. And in fact, they didn't. So, do an analysis of that and could tell that that fish could 
couldn't have come from that lake. Had to come from a different lake, um, and they were able to catch the crooks out that way. And there are many other applications like that. And as you explained, um, certain offers another species because they're higher value. So I just wanted to add that one to your story. Thank you. Thank you, Neville. Am I allowed to go and sit now? <laughs>